couple of weeks ago, I was in Orlando for the biannual General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Thank Catherine Sparks for uh, bringing you the message on that day. I hear it was spectacular, and the vote was close as to whether I should return. <laughs> Wasn't sure I was going to make it. If you've never been uh, to a convention in, in Orlando, it's the second largest convention center in the United States. Seven million square feet. Uh, and, and probably about a half a mile long. And, I was fortunate to spend uh, the, uh, the week with my son in a, in a hotel room, uh, uh, courtesy of Texas Christian University, for whom he worked. And uh, it was uh, a long walk all the way up from the hotel to where our convention was in, in uh, what they call Convention Center West, which is the old part. They had a convention center, a perfectly good one, and they about tripled the size of it uh, a while back. The interesting thing was, not only did we have four to 5,000 disciples meeting at that time, but we were sharing our part of the convention center with the NAACP, the National Association for uh, uh, Colored People, and uh, uh, the Advancement of Colored People. And uh, they also had, I don't know, three, four, 5,000 people there. And what made it really poignant at that time was that uh, during the time that we were having both of our, uh, of our assemblies, uh, the, the, uh, the results or the, the verdict in the uh, George Zimmerman trial were released. And if you didn't know, Sanford is not very far from Orlando. So we were in the midst of something that was happening uh, of national importance right in, in the middle of all this. And it, uh, it, it brought some things home and, and uh, added some things that we didn't expect to to the assembly. For instance, uh, Sharon Watkins, who is our general minister and president, uh, went over at, at the invitation and, and uh, made a short address at, at the NAACP conference. In return, they invited us to send a uh, hundred or so disciples to one of their plenary sessions, and it was hastily put together. And I, I happened to be in the right place at the right time and got to be part of that. Uh, so I, I was able to go across the convention center and hear uh, uh, three cabinet members of, of, uh, of, our, uh, of our government uh, talk about uh, things that are important. Uh, uh, Catherine Sebelius, who, Catherine Sebelius, who's the uh, uh, Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Ray Donovan, who's uh, uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and uh, uh, Eric Holder, who's the Attorney General, and this was the first time that he had talked about uh, the, the, the trial that had just gotten over. It was uh, very powerful to hear him talk about uh, that instance. And so it was uh, uh, in, in evidence to us that, that God gives the church opportunity to be in the midst of things that, that, uh, that where, the, where the church needs to express a voice. And uh, that we're not just people who go and hide on Sunday morning and pray to Jesus and then go about our lives, but we're actively involved. And so it was appropriate that the assembly was inspired by today's lectionary gospel. You might have, as you were listening, felt a little discordance, I guess, because when we hear Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, we say, what happened to the rest of it? Because we're so used to praying Matthew's version, which is a little bit longer and more extensive, that we forget sometimes that that's not the only one that's in the Gospels. And we forget sometimes that there are four Gospels for a reason. It's not just because four guys remember things differently. That each one of the Gospel writers has a different theological <coughs> perspective. There's different parts of who Jesus was and what he came to do that are understood a little bit differently in each of the Gospels. And so even though a lot of the stories are the same, they kind of get arranged in a different way. And, and it reflects what it is that that particular Gospel writer shares. We, we need to remember that, that the Gospels actually get written down. They were, they were transmitted orally for decades. They didn't actually get written down until well after Jesus had ascended 
and to heaven. So the, the, the stories kind of got rearranged a little bit according to the tradition that followed a particular gospel writer. So Luke remembers and shares with us the story of how we get to have what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he tells the story, there's this kind of three parts to this as, as, as you heard Pat reading to us. The first part is how the, the story gets introduced and what it is that we're supposed to get out of this. And then in the second part, Jesus goes a little bit further and he illustrates with a parable what it is that he's trying to tell them. And he kind of wraps it up a little bit at the end with an assurance that God hears our prayers. So in the first part, we're told by Luke that the disciples are inspired by Jesus' example. They have seen him at every juncture. When he's about to, to when you're reading Luke, you can tell that there's going to be a major shift in things. Because Jesus goes off to pray. He goes off to pray by himself. He goes off in the wilderness. He goes wherever he needs to go. And he is in constant communication and communion with God. And the disciples, I think, see that. And they want that. They want to know how to have that prayer life with God. How many of us every day say, I need to pray more? How many of us only turn to God in prayer when things are going bad? How many of us forget to listen to God as well as to speak to God? And the disciples evidently, at least according to Luke, the disciples have heard that John the baptizer has kind of rallied his disciples, rallied his troops with a prayer that they can say together. We don't know what that prayer was. Luke is the only one who even mentions this. And, and there's nowhere that tells us what it was that, that John's prayer might have been. But the disciples say, we want one too. And so they go to Jesus, according to Luke, they go to Jesus and they say, teach us to pray. Now an important thing to know, last week, we were hearing a story about a, a lawyer, a doctor of, of the religious law, who went to Jesus and, and was, was kind of trying to twist him around and turn him, turn him around. And the lawyer says to, to Jesus, how can I have eternal life for me? How can I have eternal life? Now today, Luke gives us a contrast. The disciples don't go to Jesus individually and say, teach me to pray. They go to him collectively and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And so we're told right off the bat, one of Luke's important messages for us is that prayer is not just an individual thing. It is also a collective thing. The church is called to be in prayer together. And that's one of the reasons that those who organized the, uh, the assembly for this year chose this passage to remind the church as a whole, not each individual congregation off in Loveland, Colorado, and San Francisco, California, and, and, and Orlando, Florida, and New York, New York, or wherever, but, but we're all a church together and we pray together. That's one of the things that we were supposed to be reminded of is that we are to pray together. The church has gotten a little lazy about this in the past few decades. We forget that it is the church as the body of Christ in the world that has the responsibility for teaching the discipline of prayer. How do we know that we've gotten lazy? Because we've turned to whining. We turn to whining because, because the teachers aren't allowed to lead prayers in the schools. We whine because somebody's not allowed to use the loudspeaker at a football game to lead a prayer. We whine because, because somebody's not saying a prayer at the opening of the city council meeting. We whine and we've gotten lazy because we've forgotten that it's Christians and the church that's responsible for teaching the discipline of prayer, not algebra teachers, not city councilmen, not athletic directors in a football game. It's the church's responsibility. And so we need that little kick in the head that Luke gives us through this passage. And so Jesus obliges. And he gives them a shorter example of the prayer that Matthew teaches. Matthew is, is, a, is a guy who's 
more interested in kind of the liturgical or the, the uh, uh, worship side of things. So his is a little bit more elaborate. <laughs> Jesus and Luke gives us the basics. And so he gives the disciples what they've asked for. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on further to illustrate what it is that is important about prayer. And so he shares a parable, that little middle piece. He shares a parable. And we remember that a parable is not a story that Jesus makes up. Jesus takes stories that are known or examples that are close to the people. They're culturally specific. When he talks in a parable, he talks about it as a, a situation that his listeners might actually find themselves in. So in this case, he talks about, he says, suppose you have a friend. And he's talking to people who live in small villages. They don't live in big cities. Everybody knows everybody else. And he says, suppose you have a friend who comes and knocks at the door at night and says, I've had guests show up and I need to feed them and I'm out of bread. Can you share this with me? Now in our culture, this sounds like somebody who's asking for a favor. And you know, it would be a, a bold thing in our culture to go and knock on your neighbor's door at midnight and say, can I borrow a loaf of bread to feed my brother-in-law who just showed up unexpectedly and he needs a sandwich. That'd be a big bold thing for her. Well, maybe not, not in your family. <laughs> but in the culture to which Jesus speaks and in which he speaks, the duty of hospitality is great. And we forget that. From what we call the Old Testament, the Old the Hebrew Scriptures, on up through the New Testament, People who are faithful followers of the living God are obligated to show hospitality. And no one would think of not showing hospitality. It's a shameful thing. You bring shame on your household if you fail to show hospitality. This is why Abraham shows such great hospitality in the Oaks of Mamre. Because it's an obligation. It's not just a favor. It's not being nice. It's expected of you. And not only is it expected of you, but it would be unthinkable for a real neighbor to refuse a request to assist in that neighbor showing hospitality. If for no other reason, then you might find yourself in the same situation. It's a small town. The women all go and bake their bread in communal ovens. They're all in the town square baking their bread together. They know who has the bread and who doesn't. Nobody would think of, of denying a neighbor. So this is more than a favor that's being asked. It's an obligation. So the scandal, in this case, is not the one who goes to borrow the bread. The scandal is the neighbor who makes up an excuse and says, Oh, my kids are in bed. I can't open the door and let you have it. That would be a feeble excuse. And so Jesus says, of course, even with persistence, your neighbor will be persuaded. It would be shameful if he had to be persuaded and you had to be persistent. But even so, you're going to get your bread so that you can show hospitality to your neighbor. And Jesus says, how much more will it? is your father, is your neighbor to answer your request for what it is that you need? But here's the thing. If you read that parable, the one who asks for the bread doesn't ask for himself, does he? The one who asks for the bread asks for the neighbor's assistance so that he can be a neighbor to another. We started out last week talking about who is my neighbor with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now we go a step further and we find out that what we're supposed to be praying for is not just for our own benefit. We don't just pray for the church to have a new air conditioner, which we do, by the way. <laughs> the controls adjusted. But... <clears throat> But we pray for God to give us the ability to be a neighbor to another. And that is the calling of the church. To be a neighbor to another. 
to those outside our walls, to those who haven't proclaimed membership in this particular congregation, to those who don't even know that we're here. And what we're supposed to be praying for is the ability and the guidance and the leadership and the resources necessary to be a neighbor. And then he goes on to that final part after he shares the parable, after he makes his point. <coughs> he talks about God as a parent and what it means to be a parent. And he speaks to people who have children and he says to them, would any of you, if your child came and asked you for something that, that the child needed to give sustenance, how many of you would give them something harmful instead? Now sometimes we do that inadvertently as parents because what the child asks for is not something that's necessary for sustenance. Sometimes they ask for things because the, the, the advertising that they've seen on television have told them that, that this is something that you have to have of your less of a person. By the way, it's not just little children. It's, it's we big kids too, right? <laughs> We watch, we watch those same things and they tell us that we got to have a new car, that we got to have a bigger screen for our television, that, that, that if we don't have these things, we're, we're, we're missing out on something, we're less of a person. And sometimes we're too anxious to give our children that and to give ourselves that. We go into debt to buy for our kids and for ourselves. Not the daily bread, but the big cake. Jesus says to them, your child asks for something that is needed, of sustenance. Are you going to give them harmful things instead? A snake or a scorpion? My parents bought me a rat. <laughs> Pet shop rat, not one that was caught in the alley. At least that's what my father told me. But not something that's going he says, if you who are human and subject to the human foibles and mistakes and misdirection, if even you know how to give your children good things, how much more do you think your Father in heaven, your parent who is above us and gave us life, how much more ready is God to give us what we need? So Jesus says through Luke's words, don't be hesitant to pray. But consider what it is that you pray for. And when you speak, also be ready to listen. When you knock, the door will be open. And Jesus makes the promise that that is there for us. So we find ourselves two years away from another general assembly. And the ministry of the church is once again returned where in our tradition it starts in the local congregation. We don't have a hierarchy on high that directs us to do something or not do something. We in the local church are called to be in prayer together. Individually and collectively. And so we seek not just today but every day to be a people of prayer. Asking, speaking, sharing what it is that we have heard from the living God with those who need to do it. Children in vacation Bible school, families who are grieving the loss and passing of the love, people who are ailing and injured in the body and the spirit. We keep learning from the smallest ones to the oldest ones. We keep learning as Jesus keeps seeking to teach us to pray. And so we do so willingly and with enthusiasm. We have this morning, in our moment for mission, as we prepare to accept our offering, uh, people with us 
who have been or will be going on uh, on mission trips, I'm going to invite our uh, our minister to emerging generations, Rachel Nelson, to share with us a little bit about what those missions have entailed. And uh, you you got to got to leave the sleep before you get to go again, right? A couple of hours, maybe. All right. Share with us what's happening. Hi. We. Um, we took, I think Miranda is working in the nursery. Hopefully you have an idea of who she is. Um, but Miranda Sports and Ben and myself went to Joplin, Missouri. We just got home about, let's see, two weeks ago yesterday. And we worked on two different houses, our, home, our group with uh, Heart of the Rockies and First Christian Church of Greeley worked on two different houses in Joplin um, doing repairs and uh, other work as part of the recovery efforts from the tornado that I'm sure you heard of in the news two years ago. Um, and so we had the opportunity to learn a few new skills. Um, some of them used a saw for the first time, some of them used a staple gun, a nail gun. Um, I'm not sure what else the other team learned, but they learned to put up drywall and insulation. And yes, is that, yes, okay. <laughs> Um, so that was our trip two weeks ago, and then today we are leaving with our middle schoolers. Why don't you guys come join me up here? Um, we are leaving with these three, as well as another one from our church, and another eight from Greeley and Heart of the Rockies to go to Alamosa, Colorado, to the San Luis Valley. We are going to be working with an organization, Puente Home. They have a wonderful, wonderful network of services for those in need, um, those who are homeless. They have an apartment complex for people who are transitioning out of homelessness. They have a children's program for children who are, um, who are suffering from an abuse history. Um, they're trying to integrate back into uh, home family life. Um, and what else? There's a thrift store, a food bank, and a clothing bank that are all part of this network serving the homeless and underprivileged in Alamosa. And we will be working at any number of those places. We'll find out this evening when we get there what we'll be doing exactly. The one thing we do know that we'll be doing for sure is cooking and serving meals for the shelter. We will be feeding lunch and dinner to up to, I want to say, 80 to 120 people. Um, that's about the numbers we did last year. And so these three, this is Jayla and Brooke and Tyner, and these three will be searching a big pantry and seeing what is there from the food bank and using their imaginations to decide what meals we'll be serving, and then they'll be cooking and serving them. So it'll be a great learning experience. Um, we have a couple of opportunities for you to get involved as well. Um, one is that since we're dependent on this pantry for our meals that we're serving to all of these people, we would love it if you have an extra above and beyond um, donation you'd like to make. You can just hand it to me um, and we'll get it cashed or get it into the bank. I'll deposit it when we get back. Um, but we will uh, grocery shop to supplement our meals if we want. To, if they want to add something that would give extra nutrition um, in the spirit of friendliness and neighborliness, um, we'll be running to the grocery to supplement. And then the other opportunity is that we would love. I don't know if you planned this, Michael, but we would love for you to pray. <laughs> um, to pray for our trip. To pray for our group. Uh, specifically, we have prayer partners for this trip. And I have a sign up a sign up sheet in the back that if you feel called to pray daily for one or more of these youth, um, we would like three partners for each youth to be praying for them daily, individually, um, that they have a wonderful experience. Let's start the praying right now. Dear God, we thank you for these young people and their sponsors who have read your word and heard your call 
and have responded with action. We ask your blessing with them and our sisters and brothers at Heart of the Rockies and First Christian Greeley. We pray for safe travels, traveling mercies as they go to the San Luis Valley where there is so much poverty. May they make a difference in a place that desperately needs your touch. We pray for the parents and families who will be without them for the week and pray calm and comfort for fathers and mothers and husbands and spouses. We ask your blessing on that which we have given of ourselves, financial resources and continuing prayer through the week so that their mission might be blessed and they might not only learn, but also teach the reality of your gospel. In the name of Christ who came on a mission from you, we send them forward with our blessing and yours. In the name of the living Christ, we pray. Amen. Will the deaconate now accept our tithes and offerings? 